that um, when you go into your next step in your career. So first off, you're gonna wonder why I did this, but I'm gonna show you a walking yellow duck toy. I don't know if any of you guys ever played with one of these. They were pretty popular um, back in the day. And I will tell you the reason why I'm bringing this to show you is um, very central to a lot of what my presentation's about. I wanna bring you back to my sophomore year of college at UC Davis. It's a hot spring day. My palms are sweaty, my throat's dry. And I was up in front of a lecture hall of my peers. And it was my turn to give a presentation. And the presentation was for my technical writing and presentation course. And I was there to describe how I took this yellow duck apart or one very much like it. And I learned how it worked. And I had to show in my presentation how that duck worked and make it explainable to all the people in the room. And I would love to sit here in front of all of you tonight and tell you what an amazing job I did, but it was not. <laughs> it was absolutely terrible. And I had trouble stringing three words together and it was all I could do to get through that presentation, but I did. So I want to fast forward about three years to my very first job and my very first customer presentation. And I really didn't, it's not like today, we really didn't do a lot of presentations in school. So I didn't have a lot of opportunity to practice between that very first presentation describing that duck to when I actually did a real engineering presentation. You can imagine my terror when I was preparing for that first presentation on work that I had completed with only being at work a little over eight to 10 months. I was working on a helium pressurization system design for the device here on the right, which is called LEAP. And I was also working on the nozzle design where I was doing all the thermal analysis to really understand what materials we needed to use to make sure that nozzle wouldn't burn up. LEAP was really, really important at the time I was working on it. Um, it was a lightweight, miniaturized kinetic kill vehicle. And it was designed to destroy incoming ballistic missiles, both inside and outside the Earth's atmosphere. And it was time for our preliminary design review. So I was a new engineer working on a very important project. So I wanna poll you guys right now if you guys can tell me, what have people told you to do to get ready for a presentation? What should you do to prepare? Practice, 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 absolutely. Good night's sleep. <laughs> yes, that's a good one. I didn't sleep well the night before this, though, I will tell you. What else? Practice in front of friends, yes. Speak slowly. That is always something I have to work on. Confidence, that's another really important one is have confidence when you're speaking. Double check your slides. All right, nobody know your audience is another really good one. So one thing that you guys haven't mentioned, I'm gonna bring up, but I'll do it as I go through this. I want you now, I'm gonna bring you into another situation. I want you to picture a really old building it's well air conditioned and you're in front of a large group of people. Basically large group meaning 30 professional technical people sitting around and chatting very casually before our, our preliminary design review is going to begin. And this mix of people that you're looking at is a mix from the government. It's a mix from your customer and it's a mix from people in your own project and your company. All of these people were dressed in dark suits, white shirts and very conservative ties. My stomach doing flip flops and I was really ready to get this meeting started. I was really prepared. I had practiced and I knew my material inside and out. I was confident and I wore something that made me feel good because that, that's something my mom always had told me was, 
If you're gonna present, wear something that makes you feel good so you're comfortable. Well, I was in my early 20s and I was obsessed by the color pink. I wore a light pink suit, not giving it even a second thought that I wasn't gonna look like everybody else in that room. But apparently I stood out a bit. And one of the customers that I didn't know and I hadn't met was talking to me before my presentation and his comment to me was, I'm not sure what you're doing here. You look like you're dressed for a party. You can imagine how mortified I was and how a little bit rattled I might have been um, before I was going to get up in front of that room to do my presentation. But I tell you, that comment made me stand up even taller and even prouder of who I was. And I got up in front of that entire group and I gave a presentation that nobody could um, say anything wrong about. I got up, I answered every question that people asked me and I killed it. So I went from my yellow duck presentation where I barely could string two words together and I was able to present a technical argument and a design that was accepted by my customer and my team. Um, and I will say that after this, um, working at this company, I did leave a couple years later, um, but my work was well received here and I was able to do consulting six years later on the work that I started here, which was pretty exciting. And I will say, um, I wanted to say something about pushing past stereotypes. That conversation I had in that room really rattled me. Although I did a good job on the presentation, he made me rethink of how I interacted with the people around me. Um, I, I hung up my pink suit for many years and I never wore it again. And you can imagine that I went and I purchased a dark blue suit with a white shirt. I did not wear a tie. <laughs> um, but several years later, back in 2019, I was given an award by the Simsbury Girl Scouts I'm not the Simsbury Girl Scouts, the Connecticut Girl Scouts. Um, and it was a Women Who Soar Award. And I was really proud of that accomplishment. And when I had to go and speak at their conference, I wore a pink suit. And it was my way of pushing past um, a stereotype that was put for before me many, many, many years before. So I wanna tell you, sometimes you have to fit in, but stay true to who you are. Um, work hard, respect the others around you, and you're going to earn their respect as, all, as well. So be tenacious um, and don't give up. So I went from a job at Kaiser Marquardt working on miniature rocket engines, and I always wanted to work in the space industry working you know with the astronauts working on something even more bigger in my mind more bigger is not a good word but bigger in my mind and um i'd always been fascinated by space so recruiters started calling into our company because i was here in california the recruiters were calling for jobs out in alabama and huntsville there was a brand new contract at marshall space flight center and they were trying to staff that contract um, with several hundred engineers. So they were calling everywhere to get um, engineers to come out in that area. So my husband and I both applied for the jobs down in Alabama. We wanted to get out of California, a lot of smog, a lot of traffic, really expensive to live. And we wanted to find a place to raise a family, not to mention working on space programs. So the two of us, we flew out to Alabama with a couple other people from my company and then other people from all over the United States um, to go out for interviewing. And I bought that conservative suit I told you about and I wore that suit to a formal breakfast that they had. Um, so everybody that was interviewing the weekend that I went was all um, invited to a breakfast with their spouses. Um, and we intermingled, got to meet a lot of people at the company, got to meet other people that were interviewing. And um, one of the things that happened to me that morning is another interesting thing that I had to get past. 
but I was talking with a gentleman at the breakfast and he was very friendly and he was just chatting, chatting with me. But he did ask me if I was going shopping that day while my husband was interviewing. And I thought I, it took me aback because I wasn't wearing a pink suit. I was in a navy blue interview suit. I wasn't dressed for shopping. And I looked at him, I said, very professionally, I said, no, I, I'm interviewing with Mr. Farrell today. And the poor gentleman turned bright red. He didn't know what to say. And I said, don't worry about it. I understand. And um, I ended up having a great interview with the company. Um, I really enjoyed talking with everybody. And I had a basically a really good background um, from my work at Kaiser Marquardt. So I expected to hear back from them. The funny thing is I didn't, and I didn't understand why. And there was a few people within my company getting job offers. And, you know, I really wanted this job. It was working in the space industry. And I said, geez, I'm going to do something about this. So I called the recruiter and I asked him what was going on. And then I called the hiring manager and I talked to him and I told him how interested I was and the skills that I was offering for the job. And my persistence ended up getting me the job in Alabama. And my husband and I traveled across country. We drove across the entire country to get to Alabama, which was a great experience if you haven't done it. Um, and I got the backstory. I, I learned when I got to Alabama what happened. And it wasn't me, that wasn't the problem. It was the fact that they didn't, couldn't offer both my husband and I a job because he didn't have the background that I had for that job. And so they made a decision for us and said that they weren't gonna offer me the job because they couldn't offer it to him. But the point is I had the tenacity to go forward and keep after that because it was something I wanted. I could have stepped back and I could have stayed with the status quo and not worried about it. But if you want something and you want a job, you want an internship, it's okay to call. It's okay to message somebody on LinkedIn. It's okay to ask more questions about the position and it's okay to advocate. I'll tell you that the people that do that are the ones that are gonna get the jobs. And I've hired, I did hire one high school student I never thought I would hire a high school student for my industry, but he wasn't pestery, but he called me every couple months to see if he could get an internship and I ended up giving him one. So just remember that, um, be tenacious when you're job searching. Um, all right, so the best part is I got the job and I went to Alabama. My husband got a job at Rocketdyne, so he got an awesome job. And it was a dream come true for me. I was working on the space shuttle main engine and I was working to build and put astronauts into space. So the space shuttle, and a lot of you probably remember, but some of you may not, um, was part of the NASA space transportation system. And it was designed to carry astronauts and cargo to and from Earth. The first space shuttle flight took place when I was in high school in 1981, and they flew all the way up until 2011. And when the space shuttle program ended, which was a sad day for me because that was such a big part of my growing up, they had flown over 130 missions. The cool part for me is I got to work on this bad boy right here. Um, this is the space shuttle main engine. Three of these engines were mounted at the base of the space shuttle and they were fed liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen from the space shuttle external tank during ascent into orbit. And these three engines, there are three of these guys mounted um, at the base of the orbiter. And in conjunction with the solid rocket booster, which I can show you later in one of the slides, that was enough to provide the thrust to lift the orbiter off the ground for the initial sun into space. This guy here, it was developed by Marshall Space Flight Center and it was the world's most sophisticated reusable rocket engine. Now we have new companies working on these kinds of engines, um, but this was the guy in the day. It operated for eight minutes, 
40 seconds for each shuttle flight. And the kicker here, and this is where I want you to drop your mouse a little bit, it had an output of 37 million horsepower. And at the full power was equivalent to the output of 13 Hoover dams, huge amount of power. And the combined pumping capacity of the three space shuttle main engine turbo pumps could drain an average size swimming pool in, why don't you guys take a guess? Anybody have any guesses? How fast do you think the space shuttle main engines could drain a swimming pool? Any guesses? I wanna see if anybody's close. Ah, uh, not bad. Somewhere between one and two. Closer. 28 seconds, which is unbelievable. The other thing that's pretty amazing to me is the combustion chamber reached 6,000 degrees plus F. It was hotter than the boiling point of iron. So think about the thermal management system that had to happen within this device to keep it cool. So I got to work on the high pressure oxygen turbo pump. And also I worked on um, designs for the main engine, uh, for, the, for the nozzle. So I wanna play the video for you. So listen, this is a static test firing of the engine. and feel that miles away. It was, it was just crazy. Um, but anyway, my job um, was to look at designs, design changes to the main engine that had to happen because there was failures or we had issues with parts. And I would have to get up in front of the chief engineer um, to present those changes. And his name was Otto Goetz. He was an old German engineer, very scary. And um, I watched him crush many of engineer that was not prepared to come talk to him. And I vowed it was never gonna happen. And, um, and I never did. I, I always was well prepared to go and present to him. So it was a pretty exciting job. Um, but again, I had to go and think about what's my next move. So my husband and I both decided it was time for a change. And we decided to go back to graduate school and um, after working at Huntsville for a couple of years. And so we decided to go back and get advanced degrees in engineering. We both wanted to go back and get technical degrees. He wanted to earn his PhD and I really was looking at getting a master's degree. We just wanted to do more. Um, the space shuttle main engine at that time wasn't a design from scratch. A lot of the design had been done and we were both really itching to get into the ground for floor and work on designs. So we made a decision to go back to grad school, got into Penn State, and believe it or not, I got pregnant. Um, so do we go or do we not go? You know, we were gonna give up full-time, good paying jobs to go back to grad school. So what did we decide to do? Well, of course we quit our jobs, and we moved to Penn State and we went to school. We figured we'd make it work. I ended up pursuing a graduate degree in mechanical engineering while caring for my baby daughter, Kayla. Um, she, and it, she is the love of our life. Of course, she's much older now. And it took a lot of tenacity for the two of us to do what we did. Um, and it was a big decision. My parents thought we were absolutely insane, um, but you have to do what's right for you. Think about what you want. Think about what you want to pursue. Think about what you're passionate about. So we made it through. We didn't have much money, but I would tell you it was some of the funnest times we've had. I loved grad school. So after grad school, we both accepted a job at Ensign Bickford Company. And we both accepted a job in the same group, which is interesting after the whole thing at, um, down in Alabama but we accepted a job in research and development, which is what we wanted to do. And we were developing new products for commercial mining and blasting. So it, it sounds very different than designing rocket engines or working in the rocket engine industry. But if you think about the chemicals and the energy that you're harnessing out of propellants, we were basically doing the same thing, except we were harnessing, harnessing the energy coming out of explosives and using explosives inside devices to do work. 
So I wanted to show you this video because um, this was pretty exciting. Um, it's a video of blasting the strata off the top of a pole seam. So they out in industry, they'll go and use very long columns of, of explosive um, to go ahead and blast rock off of pole seams. So they'll go in here in the rock and drill different depth holes. And those holes get filled with a large amount of explosive. And I'm talking like two foot diameter holes and 10, 20, 30 feet that get filled with explosive. And then you put a, an initiation mechanism in there in each one of those holes. And the key to doing this, it's really expensive and you have to get the timing right and you have to drill the holes precisely because you can imagine that you want to get the most rock that you can off of that coal in one shot because you're spending so much money. So everything is well engineered to get a blast like this off and they're pretty exciting to watch. So I'm going to start, the explosion is going to start back here and work its way forward. So just take a watch. So during this time, I was developing initiation systems. I got really good experience being able to go down into, I went a mile underground into a gold mine um, to see how our products work under extreme conditions, which was really exciting. And I was able to go out to some test sites where I actually filled explosive into tubes myself, working with technicians, hands deep into it, and then um, did some on, underwater testing. It's a lot of fun. So that didn't last as long as we would have liked it to, unfortunately. Um, it was a very cool job. We probably did it for 10 months or so. And then I came into work one day and I was in a really good mood. I was just, you know how sometimes you just, you, you go to work and you're really happy. And, and I saw my boss in his office that morning and I said, good morning, like I always do. And then I was pretty sarcastic with him because he was looking out the window and he was staring out the window. And I thought, well, geez, how come you're not doing any work? Turns out he had some really bad news to deliver that day. My whole research and development group was essentially being disbanded. And the majority of the group were gonna lose their jobs that morning. I was later asked in the morning to be a buddy um, and I had to be a buddy to one of my really good friends at work. And what that meant was I got to help her pack her boxes up and I got to walk her to her car. It was a really sad day and it was a really depressing time. Luckily for me and my husband, um, we were both given new jobs. They kept us on at the company and we moved over to, into the aerospace and defense group. So I was back working on space programs um, which was pretty exciting. Luckily, um, like I said, I got moved and the company had a lot of faith in me. So I was given my first real leadership role and I wasn't giving one, I wasn't given one leadership role, but I was given a role to lead two separate development efforts. And the two products that I ended up, they don't look like much here, but there's a lot more going on on the inside that you can't see. I was put in charge of developing a detonation signal interrupter and also something called a lanyard pool initiator. Both mission critical products um, to be used on the Atlas V launch vehicle, which is still flying today. We also had received six or so more components to be developed for Atlas V that were all being developed concurrently. And there was a couple different people leading these projects. So I'm moving into a new part of the company and I'm being put in a lead position. I was super nervous walking into my first meetings to meet these teams. You know, what am I gonna say? Are they gonna listen to me? How am I gonna get them to do work for me? 
Will they respect me? What happens if I fail? Well, how many of you guys have had a project so far in college that hasn't worked out quite like you thought? Anybody want to put something in the chat? Or maybe everything's gone really well for you guys so far. I don't know how many senior projects you've had. Nobody's willing to put something up. Okay, senior project was fully online. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you right now. Oh, Rube Orbo machine. <laughs> That's a good one. I'm going to tell you, everybody in this room at some point, if you're an engineer, you're going to have a failure. It's going to happen. It's, I just can't picture it not happening. Everybody I know has been through one. Uh, it just happens that I had two failures at one time. Both of my designs, first time out, had issues. And in fact, the whole company was stressed because not only my designs failed, but the other designs that we were working on were failing about the same time. Because you know what? This was the first time my company had ever worked on a major project like an Atlas V, where we were doing all these components. I had never even worked on explosives for a launch vehicle application. And if any of you guys are studying aerospace, um, you're probably learning that the environments are really extreme. You have extreme shock loading from the launch. You have extreme vibe loading from the launch. You have extreme temperatures that you're dealing with. And I was new to using explosives in these kinds of applications. So I had a lot to learn. This was probably one of the most stressful times in my entire career. Um, not only was I dealing with design failures, but I was also dealing with some really difficult team members. Um, one of the most difficult team members was a designer and he quit on me one week before we were going into our critical design review. He was stubborn and mean and did everything he could to make my life difficult. And the crowning blow was leaving a week before our critical design review. So I had to pivot and I had to pivot really quick because we had to present in front of that customer um, what we were doing for this design. So I will say that we pulled it together and it worked out fine. And honestly, I was happier in the end. Um, but I will say during this whole process, one of the program managers found me in my cube crying one night. He was really kind and he was very supportive, but you can imagine my embarrassment. I, I was thoroughly, I was thoroughly embarrassed. You never want anybody to see you cry, but I will tell you that it's going to happen. Um, there's going to be a point that it's going to happen. It's, it's hard. Um, you're going to be doing hard things when you get out of school, but I will tell you, this gentleman, he was one of the first ones to come and congratulate me when I became vice president and reminded me of how far I had come. And it meant a lot, it meant a lot to me at the time. Um, so tenacity, pushing past boundaries. What did I learn here? Well, I learned how to be professional in dealing with mean people. I learned how to create new designs in a completely new application where I had to go and do a lot of research to figure out what to do. I ran, I learned how to run two failure investigations simultaneously with a lot of customer pressure. I learned how to deal with a, a situation where I lost a team matter, member in a very critical situation. And I learned how to lead a team. So I can't tell you how many times during this process I wanted to quit, but I didn't. And I did this raising two small children. So I will tell you, go out there and stick to it. At the end of this whole process, I was having my review with my boss and I was done qualifying because I went through and got these parts fully qualified. And he asked me, he says, what do you want to do with your career? And I sat and I looked at him I said, wow. And I didn't really think twice. I said, I want to stay home with my children. I want to go part time. It's not the answer he expected from me. I can tell you that he kind of looked at me and he said, what? Um, 
but I work for a really incredible company and he supported me and helped me get the support I needed to go part-time. And I was the first person at the company to make a request like that. And they accommodated me. In fact, to the point where I worked from home, I was the first person to have a computer at home working from home that they had to set up for me working part-time so I could spend time with my girls. And the reason why I bring this one up is because it's okay to sometimes step back in a career. You don't have to be perfect all the time. You know, I'm a tenacious person. I get what I want. And to be honest, this is another time that I got what was important to me. And what was important to me was my family. And so I took a step back for a little bit from my career. I still kept my toes in it. I was still working, but I also reinvented myself. I learned how to go back and do analysis with new tools. I learned how to use ANSYS and SOLIDWORKS. I learned how to do reliability for all these components. And I was able to support my company in a different way. And I also was crazy enough, um, and I loved it, is I ended up running two Girl Scout troops. I ran multiple Girl Scout Campery weekends for 250 people. And I ran the Girl Scout service unit for my town for over 600 girls and 200 adults. But I did that with my kids because they were part of Girl Scout. And I will tell you that that time off and the learning I did doing the leading I did in Girl Scouts helped me get my first manager job because I used those skills um, as a part of my interview and the rationale for hiring me. So the really exciting part, so I became the manager of aerospace and I don't know, probably a year later, the big reward came in my mind. Um, we had been working on a new product. Eric here was the designer and we worked on what's called a frangible joint assembly, which is an explosive device that separates um, this, in this case, it separates the fairing from the rocket at this location. Um, it uses an explosive called HNS that's fully contained in an assembly. And we got to go out to Kennedy Space Center um, to see the frangible joint installed on the Atlas V rocket. And um, we got to see this Atlas V inside the vehicle assembly building. So I was able to, we were both able to walk all the way up and down the rocket to see that our parts were installed correctly because we had more than the frangible joint. We had those couple devices that I had designed earlier and a bunch of other ones. And there was a bonus that, that week too because we got to go see the space shuttle on the launch pad. Um, we got to see Atlantis um, right before its last launch into space. And we got to walk all the way up to the top of the launch pad, which I don't know if any of you have gotten an opportunity to do that, but they ask you if you're afraid of heights before you get up there, because there's been many a person who can't even get out of the elevator. Because you walk out and it's over 153 foot tall and it's all grading. So you're looking straight down all those floors straight down to the ground and it's it's a little unner unnerving at first, I would say, but it was pretty exciting. And, you know, I worked on the space shuttle main engines here. I was able to look up inside the engines. We were able to stand right up next to the external tanks. I was able to look in the cockpit for the crew quarters for the shuttle. Um, I was able to see all the shuttle tiles up close and, and you could see how beat up, you know, from multiple flights. Um, orbiter was. It was just a really exciting experience all the way around. And um, Eric and I were, you can see how happy we are right here in this picture. So here's Atlas V. And part this talk is all about perseverance. So I couldn't help but bring up um, the Perseverance rover and how it landed on Mars this February. And, I, and the fact that an Atlas V rocket um, launched it into space. So I wanted to show you the beginning of this video. Make it real. So this is what we've been talking about. So pers persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. So. And here we are with Mars. Per 
Perseverance, 51 years later, getting ready to do the first ever Mars return mission. Eventually, we can bring those samples back to Earth and determine for the very first time, did life exist on Mars? straight and show you the launch just because it's fun seconds we will hear the team ECS reduce for launch give my final 25 go. seconds status check go atlas go centaur go mars 2020 there we go we are ready to go lift off this morning joshua Seven, six, five, five, four. Engine ignition, two, one, zero. Ready and lift off. As the countdown to Mars continues, the perseverance of humanity launching the next generation of robotic explorers to the red planet. It's pretty cool when you think about and, uh, you something so momentous as something like this. So that was pretty exciting for me. So the last big thing is, you know, I, I figured I needed to end it on where I am today. And so for me now, it's all about leading change as a vice president. And the big change for us came back in 2015 with a new CEO that came a part of our company and really with a, a vision to make us even larger than we were and bring more acquisitions into the company to provide a wide por portfolio for us. And he also brought a new way of doing work. And this brought a new opportunity for me as a new VP of engineering. But leading change is hard. Um, going through change is hard and it takes perseverance. Most people don't like it. And we've gone through a lot of change all for the good and I basically have taken engineering um, from a very small organization of maybe 20 people to an organization of over 150 at this point. Our electronics, I, I'm highlighting our electronics organization because this is our big change in the last two years. We've grown from $3 million to $40 million in the last couple of years. And we've gone from 14 to 84 people in our electronics area. And the really exciting part with the growth is, is learning and growing um, new designs and, and also having those people develop new designs for new missile applications. But we put in a whole PCBA line this last year. So being able to see um, and develop our own PCBA assemblies is pretty exciting. Um, one of them is shown here. This is one of the first ones we had come off our line. And we're using our electronics, new electronics area to design and develop initiation systems for missile applications. And there's a lot of work going on in missiles today with what's going on around the world. So it's pretty exciting. And this is a picture of some of our team members from the electronics area. Um, I wanted to show the people because to me, the people are one of the most important things about my job today. So what has taken tenacity for me lately, um, it's the strategy work to figure out where we're taking our electronics business. It's revamping engineering to use lean engineering methodology. I put in a machining center um, with all kinds of um, new 3D printing capabilities. Um, we've add, added a machining center to allow us to make parts in house for new development and we integrated a new business. So it's been super exciting and a lot of work. <laughs> so um, as you grow and you change in your career, your problems just get, I would say, just more complex and different. So from today, what I want you to take away from my talk is perseverance despite the odds is what gets success. Talent counts once. Your effort that you put into what you do counts twice. And I encourage you to go look for Angela Duckworth. Um, she has a TED talk about this very topic that'd be worth for you guys to go look at. But just remember, 
I was not the top of my class at school. I was not the first chosen for projects, but I did go out and I made opportunities for myself. Don't sit back and wait for things to come your way. You have to make your own opportunities. I still do that today. Don't be afraid to take risks. Go out there and see what you're made of. Push the boundaries. Think about the risks that I took. They're pretty scary now that I think back at it. But my husband and I moved from California where we lived our whole life. We drove across country and we moved to a whole new um, state in the South. We also quit our jobs. I quit a full-time paying job to go back to school. My parents thought I was insane, but it was one of the best things that my husband and I ever did. I also took a big risk in, in asking to go part-time. So please know yourself and know what is important to you and make sure you always keep that in the forefront of what you do. And most of all, at the very end, I wanted to give you my quote, uh, give you a quote from my daughter and I. Live life at the edge of your comfort zone. If you get too comfortable, you stop growing. So always be reaching. And all your risks aren't going to be successful. You're going to have failures, but you got to pick yourself up and you got to keep moving on. And then the last picture I had is a fun one. Um, because it makes for some conversation, is I have um, some pictures of just recent experiences. I jumped out of a plane, um, not of my own accord, I would say. My daughter asked me to jump out of a plane with her for her 21st birthday. And she asked me when she was 18. And I said, sure, let's do it, no problem. <laughs> Thinking she'd forget by the time she was 21. But we ended up doing it, my two daughters and I, we jumped out of a plane over Kauai and uh, it was the most amazing experience I've probably ever done. Um, it was really cool. And this is Ducky. Um, you remember the little yellow duck at the beginning of the presentation? Well, here's Ducky. And then um, I just recently did a really cool camping trip out in the middle of Utah. Um, it was a four day excursion, my daughter, her fiance, my husband and I, I haven't been camping in probably 25 years and we camped out with this view. Um, we went out to the maze, maybe 2,000 people visit there a year. So it's a pretty remote area of Utah and you have to take a four wheel drive truck in there to get out to where we were, it's pretty exciting. And then my favorite trip of all was going to Africa. So this is South Africa. This elephant was right, in, I was sitting in this truck right here. And then this picture is a little zoomed in but not too far away from where we were. Um, he's killing a warthog for his dinner. Um, it's just an amazing picture. It took him a long time to choke them. It's not bloody. Um, so that was fascinating too, something really different. So I can either show you a couple really cool explosive videos or we can just chat with questions. So I'm gonna open it up to everybody to see if they have any questions about the talk. And if I don't get any questions, I'm going to show you two explosive videos that are very cool. Oh, that's cool. So you guys got to watch Perseverance in class. That's awesome. That's very cool. Okay, I'm going to show you a really cool video. Um, and you guys can think of questions. I'm not going to leave until I get a couple questions. Okay, so this is uh, a man, something called a man portable line charge we designed. And I'm showing it to you because it's a rocket propelled um, line charge to clear mines away so soldiers can walk safely in the field. And it's just a really cool video. It's one of my favorites. So this is something we designed at my company just about a couple years ago um, as an urgent need for the warfighter. So something very different from aerospace. So watch for the red light. See, that's the rocket propelled. That's the rocket pulling a line charge full of explosives. We're going to see an initiation line up here. 
heavy and it was hard to stand this one. Yeah. So basically, this line charge is exposing any of the mines that the soldiers might have stepped on as they crossed that bridge. It's a safety device that we designed and developed very quickly as an urgent need for the Army. And um, it's pretty exciting to work on. So something just, there's so many things you can do when you get out of school. Aerospace is amazing, but there's lots of other things that are pretty amazing too. Um, so that's what I, that's what I have. Any questions? There's a few questions in the chat, Meryl. Oh, okay, what do we got? It starts with, um, what is your favorite project that you've worked on? And then it's all, all down from there. You know, it might be one that I didn't even talk about. <laughs> I worked on scrubbing hydrogen off of ammonia boring. And I did the analysis and the testing and the design of that. And it was a research project I worked on for a couple of years at Ensign Bickford. So that one was pretty cool. And then I would say those two Atlas V projects um, that I described in my talk were also some of my favorite. What else do we have here? Have you had any struggle specifically because you're a woman in STEM? Yes. Yeah, I, yes, definitely. Um, I described a couple of them, it's just the, the first initial impressions that people don't expect to see a female. And, you know, that was the breakfast. You know, he didn't expect me to be an engineer. You know, it was the gentleman at my first design review who didn't have any idea I was going to be one of the presenters. Um, uh, the, the gentleman I had struggled with that left a week before didn't appreciate having a female lead on the project. Um, so, yeah, I've had to deal with it. And, it, and it's okay, you just have to work through it. And you work through it by working really hard and earning respect, and then nobody looks at you differently. Like today, they don't look at me differently as a female. I don't see it. Um, what are your favorite interview questions? Ooh, okay, you wanna know one of my favorite interview questions? Um, what is your, what three adjectives would you use to describe yourself? And if you're really prepared for your interview and you really know yourself, you can come up with those three adjectives pretty readily. Um, what's another favorite interview question? That's my absolute favorite. I mean, I have a, I can send you my interview questions. If you guys are interested, I'm happy to share because um, I have some good ones. Another one is usually people want to ask you about a time you've struggled and how you overcame that struggle. Um, that talks to you as a person and, and it talks about your tenacity. Um, Cause we wanna know here that you can make it through trouble. You can make it past design issues. So we'll ask um, questions around that. I like that. And what characteristics do we look for? I look for creativity. I mentioned in my talk uh, and I didn't mention her name but we just hired somebody from California. I'm, I'm actually moving her out from California. She's the one that designed her own computer. She's the one that designed the um, sensor system for her bedroom door. Looking for innovation, looking for being a little bit different than everybody else that might come across um, an interview for an internship. Um, looking for leadership. You know, being part of an organization and leading is a big thing that we look for. Um, what else? How do you know when to choose? Oh, you know, when do you know how to choose career family? That's such an individual question. For me, I never thought I'd have to make a choice. I always thought I'd be career, career, career but you have those children. And I have to tell you, it's, it pulls on your heartstrings. And a lot of people do both. I just didn't wanna miss out. I, I felt like I was starting to miss out on some things. And to me, family has always been super important to me. So stepping back and being with them is really important. So it's, it's gonna be a personal choice. And I don't even think you can know what the right choice is for you until you get in the middle of it. Because some people 
it's no problem. They can, they like doing the career and having the kids and having a nanny. It, it works fine, but everybody's different. Does the pace of the aerospace industry in particular make? Um, no, I think really any job can make it hard to have a family and a career. I don't think it's just aerospace, not by any means. Um, uh, trying to find a job where I would, you know what, I would connect with people on LinkedIn. Definitely. I would try and go to um, events like this one where you can learn about different industries so you know where to do some research of places you might be interested in. Um, where to find a job. I mean, we're hiring. A lot of places are hiring during COVID. Um, a lot of places aren't. They're not doing great. Um, where would you? I would go through your career center and make sure you're doing the virtual interviews. Um, I would troll that. You guys have such an amazing ability to troll the internet that we didn't have. Um, just looking for different companies. That's what I would do. What would your, oh, you would ask that, huh? <laughs> um, creative. I have my three words at home. That's so funny. You put me on the spot. Um, a leader. And um, I'm very intuitive, I would say. What about you, Julia? What would you put for yours? Honestly, that's an excellent question. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I stepped away for a second, but I'm back now. Um, honestly, I might put, I think I've been asked this in an in interview before and I said things like, um, I actually did say leader um, as well. I probably said things like, you know, really goal focused, um, really like keeping the goal of a, um, of a project at, at my main focus. And also, um, I wouldn't say people person, I'd use a better word, but probably a people person. I work well with people. Yeah, work at, you like working in teams or- Yeah. Sure, no, those are good ones. And just be able to back up why, you know, if you give your three adjectives, you may get asked, but why'd you pick those three? Just be able to give some examples. Um, sometimes, you know, people talk about being organized. You know, they're, they're very good at organizing data and information and, that kind of a thing that comes through a lot. What else do you guys have? Oh, here we go. Do you recommend getting a master's degree after graduation or is it better? You know, everybody's a little bit different on this. I really was ready to get out of my undergraduate school. Um, I was ready to go and get a job. I loved, loved graduate school. It was my favorite. I don't think I personally would have appreciated it right out of, right out of undergrad. Um, so I was glad I waited. I was actually really glad I went full time and didn't try and do it while I was doing a job. But if a job is going to pay for you to go get your master's degree, take advantage of it. Like our company will pay for you to go to school. Um, take advantage of it and take a class or two at a time. Um, but some people want to get it all done and they go straight through. So it's really, it's an individual you know, how do you feel when you finish undergrad? Do you have a job waiting for you? Do you not have a job? Some people go straight to grad school because they haven't gotten a job yet. Um, some people are doing the five-year program. So it's, I think it's, I personally really enjoy getting onto industry, getting experience under my belt, seeing what was out there, and then knowing where I wanted to do my research. So I think that's the one advantage you have if you see a little bit more of what's available. Oh, yeah, it's, I don't know where you can work in aerospace without a citizenship or a green card. I know that we won't hire anybody, unfortunately. And it is unfortunate because I know there's a lot of you out there. I will tell you there's aerospace activities going on all, all over the world now though, um, depending on what country you're from. Would it be too forward to ask to connect? No, you guys, anybody here that's online, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm happy to have a conversation with anybody offline. Um, if you need help, just, yeah, that's why I do these things. Um, yeah, and it here, I'll check in my chat, our company. So my company is easy. 
should be able to get to our company there. Um, and there's also, I think it's www.evi. This is our overall company. Because Honeybee is a part of our company as well. Um, see if those work. Why did you choose to go to graduate school? Oh, you know what? I, I wanted to learn more about engineering. I wanted to get more in depth in the analysis and understand it. Like I went back and I did, I love, some people are gonna slap me, but I love thermodynamics. I love fluid dynamics. I love um, those kinds of classes. And when you go to graduate school, you really get into depth on that material. So um, I went to get more in depth in engineering and learn more. Um, was the main reason a change of pace? I think I wanted more out of my career than doing what I was doing. And I felt like getting a more in-depth technical degree would help me advance in my career, which I will tell you getting a technical degree in engineering and a master's looks good in an aerospace industry. It definitely looks good in our company to come in with a master's degree. Now, how did you learn to be tenacious and make space for yourself? You know, the tenacity, I think I've been tenacious for a long time. <laughs> I don't know, you know. I, uh, you have to want something badly enough, I think. And I, you have to decide what you want, what you want to go after. So you're going to have, you need some passion. And um, you need the confidence too, because to be tenacious, I think you need a little confidence. Um, so I don't know, I'm willing to explore that more. You want to give me more on the question. And how do you make space for yourself? What do you mean by that? Like time for me? Time for what I want to do outside of work? Is that, Nico, is that what you're looking for there? I really enjoy what I do. So making space for myself, I hike, I travel, I walk my dogs. I like, I told you I was creative. I really like um, crafts and art and that kind of thing. But I'm pretty passionate about my job. So I work a lot of hours because I enjoy it. Oh my gosh, asking for a raise or a job. You guys have, no <laughs> I tried to be real in my conversation and my presentation because I did not have a lot of confidence walking out of, um, walking out of college. It was really hard for me to go after that first job. Um, I, I will tell you that, whew, um, you know what? I wouldn't be afraid of people like, because I'm a VP of engineering, you might be scared to talk to me, but an executive person is a real person just like you and anybody that's standing next to you. So just remember that the people you're talking to are real people, just like you. And asking for a raise or a job when you're ready for it, I think you know. And ask for advice. Don't feel um, don't feel bad about asking for advice on trying to figure out how to ask for that raise or that promotion. Um, especially when you get into industry, there's going to be people that will support you in that. Um, <laughs> uh, the only female in a lot of don't think of you, yourself as the female in the room. Don't look at yourself as being different. Um, Think about what you need to learn in the situation. Think about how you can ask questions to interact with those around you. Um, think about working hard to earn the respect of your peers. Yeah, it's, it's hard being the only female. I, I will tell you, it was really hard um, when I was in engineering school being one of only a couple female. And even like I told you my first job, I described that room because it was so intimidating to me for that first presentation. I was the only female in the room and I was 22. So it was really, um, you know, kind of overwhelming, but I had to get through it. I don't even look at it now. I'm on our executive leadership team. I'm the only female, but I don't get into the room and think I'm a female anymore. I just I, I don't even think about it. It's, it's hard, uh, it is hard. I would find, I mean, 
can you find some support from other females being in an organization that can support you as you're going through engineering school? That'd be one place I would look. Um, I was really fortunate. Um, I met my husband like the first day of undergraduate school and he was my best friend and my biggest supporter through a lot of things we went through um, where I was one of only a few female. So I had a support, you need to find a support structure to help you navigate is what my advice would be. Anything else, Julia? Uh, well, if we don't have any more questions, I mean, we're definitely open to, um, you know, ending early if Meryl's okay with that. Um, unless you have another video of explosions to show us. I have one more video if you want to see it. Yeah, absolutely. More. Um, hold on. I can also reshow this one. I usually have the same place. Okay. So this, oh, I don't want to start it yet. So this is, this is another really fun project I've worked on actually. Um, I, when you asked me about my favorite projects, this is a linear um, shape charge assembly. So this green part here is explosive. And then there's a flexible copper liner underneath it. When you detonate this material, it makes a cutting jet and that cutting jet can break through metal, brick, walls. And one of the fun things I did at my work was I used to design these. Um, I wrote a couple papers on them and I did a lot of work. So this, this video here is about one of our products that shoots through walls. If it goes, hold on. Oh, that would be sad. I lost you guys. Do you guys see my screen anymore? Hold on. Um, Hold on, something happened. Hmm. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to show you. I lost the screen. Yeah, I believe you're in your Outlook now. We're seeing your, your mail actually. You see my mail? Yes. <laughs> you don't wanna see my mail. <laughs> That's no fun. Oh, there we go. We're back on, on uh, the PowerPoint now. So. So this is a video, I'm not gonna show the whole thing, but this is soldiers. They're going in to do a breach against a wall. So they're trying to get, this is simulating them um, trying to get into a compound where there might be some bad guys or where they have to rescue somebody. Um, so they're watching out where they're going. And this is a device that we designed and developed at Ensign Victor. It's called a rapid wall breaching kit. And this shape chart shown up here that I helped work on actually is going to be used to reach a wall. They're putting it together and getting the charge ready. This is the shape chart here. Um, this is the explosive. It's a big piece of explosive. Okay, so this is where they're going to they're going to go ahead and breach this wall. So they're putting the silhouette up against the wall with the explosive. And they need to do this really fast. Um, Cause if you can imagine, people are gonna hear them coming up to the wall and they're gonna start getting shot at. So this has to be rapidly deployed. Hence the reason rapid. Um, and so you can watch them get it on the wall and then you'll see what happens. This is a little bit of a training video too. So you're gonna learn how to put it on. initiate the charge. This is the charge right here, the explosive charge. He's going to back away a certain distance because this has a lot of explosive output. It's going to be sending a detonation shockwave out and they have to be far enough away. He's pulling a pin, a safety pin, and now he's going to pull the initiator.
What's the biggest destruction technology you've seen? Oh, SpaceX. SpaceX and landing a rocket on a floating pad in the middle of the ocean. That's that to me was huge. Um, I would have never thought we'd ever see that in our lifetime. Um, that was and also developing. You know, there's one. Um, and I think it's relativity. I, I might be wrong, so don't quote me on this. There's one aerospace manufacturer out there for launch vehicles that's trying to do a completely 3D printed launch vehicle, Starship, maybe. Yeah. No. Yes. Um, what else have I seen that's disruptive? Really disruptive. I think the space SpaceX is probably the biggest one. Hey, if you want to talk about somebody that's got tenacity and has taken a lot of risks. You should read about Elon Musk. I would never work for him, but he's, oh my God, he's amazing with what he's done and how many times he's failed and pushed himself back up again um, to move forward with the things that he wants to see happen. Yeah, you watched almost every, I know they just had an accident recently. He's insane. <laughs> he's pushing things. I mean, think about the tunneling he's doing. Think about the batteries. Think about Tesla. Um, He's definitely an innovator that's making big changes. Um, impressive. Well, I don't know. I haven't done a lot of research on that. What do you, uh, I'll have to look it up and do some research on that one. Yeah, it sounds crazy. <laughs> you know, I'd like to run a business, I think, in five to 10 years. I'd, I'd like to see myself running a small business. in the next five to 10 years. Um, taking, you know, I, I'm thinking $20 million business. Yeah, aerospace related. Um, not something brand new. I'm not a Elon Musk. I don't have his innovative skill set, but maybe going into an industry and, and leading a team. I like aerospace. I love this stuff too. I have to admit like the soldier system stuff is just, a lot of fun too. I like it as almost as much as aerospace. I still have a soft spot for the aerospace industry though. The good news is right now I get to do this. I get to do missile applications and I get to do aerospace. So I get to see all three because um, I have engineers that support all three. Um, so seeing the strategy and what we're doing on all three industries is a part of my job. Well, I think, I mean, it was really nice having you all here. I wish we could have been in person. It's a little more interactive, but um, I appreciate everybody coming. Yeah, if there are no any other questions, um, I can definitely send along any questions you guys have or come up with. If you just want to email them to me, I can definitely um, send those over to Meryl. And uh, we're going to be putting this on YouTube again, so I can add those to um you know, the YouTube description or comment section. Um, but thank you so much to Meryl for being here, for being our first keynote lecture of the Amelia Earhart Summit. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I really thought your talk was super relatable, just the way that you delivered it. And I really appreciated how interactive it was too. And I'm sure everyone here did too. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, this again will be on the Women in Aerospace YouTube channel. And um, any closing thoughts, Meryl? Just go out there and make it happen. You know, you're going to learn confidence over time and where you need help, go and seek help to get where you want to go. Um, you're not going to do it by yourself. Ask people for help. So good luck um, and do great things. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.